Hello everyone. I'm here to talk today about some flow boiling experiments uh, that uh, Isam Mudawar did uh, about 20 years ago. And uh, my name is Tim Fisher, and I apologize that I can't be there today. I have uh, I have to leave early tomorrow morning to go overseas, and uh, the the timing of this uh, session was not was not clear. So I really do apologize for that. Um, but I would not <clears throat> at all miss the opportunity to talk about my colleague and friend uh, Isa Mudawar and, and the work that he's done. Uh, I think many people in the community uh, know him and, and even more uh, know of his work. And uh, so when Laurent uh, asked me to participate in this, uh, he was the, the first person that I thought of. Um, and uh, so today I'm going to go through uh, a paper that he wrote. It was about uh, 20 years ago. He wrote with a student. And um, I'll go through kind of the my thoughts about uh, what's so special and what's so great about about this experiment. So the work that we'll talk about here is the paper by Bowers and Mudawar, um, and it showed up in International Journal of Heat and Mass Transfer. Uh, the topic is in the title here, but basically uh, what happens in flow boiling situations when you have very small channels, and in particular uh, what's the difference between a, a small channel and a very, very small channel, a micro channel? Uh, and that question hadn't been answered fully uh, or even really significantly uh, before this paper. And, uh, and then this led to uh, quite a few other studies down the road, and that's sort of what makes it such a great piece of work. Uh, and I'm going to kind of dissect the paper, uh, give you the anatomy of, of certain parts of it, and then talk about some of the results today. So Isam, uh, if you read any of his papers, I think you'll know he's, uh, he, he writes very well. His students write well. Uh, he's very clear. And, um, and so and especially in the motivation part of the paper, uh, I just enjoy reading uh, the way that he writes it because it's, it's so candid um, and frank, and you know what the paper is going to be about and why, they're, why they've done the work. Uh, in this case, uh, they start talking about flow boiling, uh, but the uh, the issue one of the issues that was coming up then and you know, still exists today is that uh, vapor bub bubbles form and while those can increase heat transfer they also increase pressure drop and so what's the trade off there and this is this is a paper that really starts to answer that question um, he compares it to something this is back in ninety four so uh, certainly micro channels were popular uh, for single phase flow at that time and even ten years before that. Um, and then the question becomes, what do, you know, how do the pressure losses, uh, how do the pressure losses change probably for the worse when you uh, put a two-phase flow into the microchannels? And so uh, then in, in this paper he said, well, maybe we don't need such small channels. We go with something that is not micro, but mini is the word that he used, uh, something a little bit a little bit larger, so 10 to 50 times larger is, is the range that he, he at least talked about here. And then uh, in this paper they chose one micro channel and uh, a mini channel to compare boiling performance. So the, uh, the system is shown here. I think uh, most of you who've read Isam's paper, papers and certainly anyone who has visited his lab uh, you know that he is he's really an artist at <coughs> putting together beautiful experiments uh, and beyond that of course they're uh, they're extremely well well done uh, and complete and thoroughly instrumented uh, and so this is the the p and ID diagram on the left where he's showing all of the various things that one has to do um, for uh, for flow boiling experiments with uh, valves and pumps reservoirs and so forth um, in this case, by the way, the refrigerant was R113, and um, and he put this into a into a flow loop <coughs> with the test module sort of situated in the middle, a uh, number of flow meters uh, that were there, and then other uh, other instrumentation to do the uh, the thermal characterization. And in this um, in this system, he put the uh, the heat sink, a mini or a microchannel heat sink sort of embedded into a housing uh, that would also provide some uh, 
uh, thermal insulation, mechanical rigidity, and so forth. I mentioned before that the test articles uh, were uh, there were of two types. On the left, uh, we see a mini channel, and so those um, those channels there were three ports, uh, circular, and flow was going linearly through them from one end to the other, and their sizes were about uh, three millimeters. And uh, then we had microchannels that had about half of a millimeter or 500 micron or so uh, diameters, or I think those were, um, those were hydraulic diameters. And these, uh, and this, uh, the mini channel had, um, and the, the micro channel had a thick film resistor uh, that was put on top as a, as a power supply. Of course, the kind of the main thing that you look for in a in a boiling paper is a, a, an understanding of how the heat flux changes as the uh, as the surface temperature changes. And so, on the left here, we have uh, mini channel results, and on the right, we have micro channel results. And what people tend to look for, for those of you who don't do a lot of boiling work, um, we look for a high vertical slope of this curve. It's on a log-log scale, by the way. Um, and the different curves correspond to different inlet subcooling conditions. And uh, so you look for a high vertical slope, and then you see this uh, tailing off, this plateauing that happens in both cases, and this is typical of most boiling situations. Uh, you have this plateauing that then leads to this rightward arrow in both cases, in the mini and microchannel cases. And that right, rightward air, arrow signifies a dry out condition or a, a critical heat flux condition where suddenly when, if you were controlling heat flux, the, uh, the temperature, the surface temperature would jump very quickly. And, uh, and so that's, a, that's sort of a, a catastrophic condition that, that people, that an engineer would want to avoid. And if you look at these curves, and I have another one a little bit later that, that shows um, sort of more of a summary of this and, and a direct comparison on a single graph. Uh, but the curves are actually quite similar. The mini channels and the micro channels perform, in, in a sense, you know, very similarly in terms of, uh, of heat flux and temperature. So their effective heat transfer coefficient, uh, coefficients are fairly similar. There are some other differences that are important that, uh, that we'll get to in a moment. So one of those is that if you look at the data, there was a big pressure drop uh, in the micro channel as compared to the mini channel, which had a very, very small pressure drop. Um, and so here he's kind of digging into the data a little bit deeper. And uh, in this case, you have this, uh, this temperature as out, this is the outlet temperature as a function of the heat flux. So as the heat flux increases, you would expect the outlet temperature to increase, of course. But then once you start to boil, then you'll have a two-phase mixture and you'll have latent heat. And so you reach this plateau in, in outlet temperature that is a little bit under the saturation temperature uh, of the outlet condition. And that's because you have a two-phase mixture. And then once it comes out, then they'll kind of uh, the, the two phases will mix back together. Some condensation will occur because you've lost your heat source. Um, and it's a little bit less than the saturation outlet temperature. But importantly, for the microchannel, which is on the right, because of that large pressure drop, the saturation temperature, that's the boiling temperature, um, of the outlet condition decreases. Uh, and so that's another factor in this. If you're really to design a system, uh, you'd, you'd have to account for that. That large pressure drop produces a, a smaller outlet saturation temperature, and that causes actually the outlet temperature of the fluid to decrease. Um, and that sort of overall um, situation would, would make for generally uh, less favorable overall heat transfer in a system. The big practical consideration here, and I've mentioned it a few times, was the pressure drop. And so here's a comparison on a single graph of the experimentally measured pressure drop as a function of the predicted pressure drop according to a correlation that's, that's in the paper. And uh, the circles here are results for the microchannel 
and the squares are the results for the mini channel. And here we have, he, he's put uh, error bars on this, and you see that almost all of the very low pressure drops measured and predicted uh, are for the mini channel. They're down in this region and in the, in the region below a value of, of 0 0.01 bar, whereas the pressure drops for the micro channels are much higher, and all of these are with changing flow rates and changing uh, heat, uh, heat flux conditions. But they shoot up, and this is a this is a log graph, and that's important to recognize also. And you see that for the micro channels, the pressure drops are an order of magnitude more uh, or more um, than the than for the mini channels, and that's a very significant practical consideration. So just to kind of put, I, I was pulling graphs from the um, from the paper itself, and they're a little bit grainy. It was just before. I think uh, these papers were digitized, and so Isam was kind enough to give me uh, a sort of a summary graph. And this here we have uh, photographs of the of the samples of the test articles uh, in the top, and uh, sort of a qualitative look at, uh, or a more qualitative look at some of the factors here. Um, here's a comparison on the left of the flow boiling curves for micro and mini channels and the CHF, and you see really what we're what, what's happening here is that the boiling curves are, are quite similar. They're not exactly the same, uh, but the CHF, the critical heat flux, is also very similar for the two, although, again, it's a log scale, so it's not, they're not sort of lying on top of each other. Um, and so if one just looked at the boiling performance, you'd you know, probably say that it's you know, a pretty close comparison, um, not a big difference between the two. But on the right graph, if you look at pressure drop, as a function of heat of heat flux, you see that um, that you have this uh, one, once the boiling really becomes vigorous around you know as approaching 100 watts per square centimeter, the pressure drop in the microchannel shoots up uh, exponentially. It looks like here um, and becomes much 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 larger than the pressure drop that you have in the mini channel, even when you're under vigorous boiling conditions. And that's the observation here. And the comparison that really I think uh, captured the attention of of the community, and they said, you know, if we have these microchannels, which were sort of a very hot topic at the time, um, the the boiling curves may or may not, you know, show a significant advantage of the small size, but the pressure drop penalty is very significant, and it has a, a big impact if you would want to integrate this into a real engineered system. So Isam's also very uh, conscientious about putting his results into into a context that um, that people can use, the community can use, and so in this case he, he used a uh, a CAHF correlation that's shown in the upper left. The Weber number uh, lengths and and channel diameters are shown, and the exponents here are the things that he uh, that that were put into the correlation based on uh, the data. From, from his studies. And then in the bottom, uh, uh, the bottom correlation, uh, there's a pressure drop correlation with a, a factor F sub TP that they, that they put in G, in this case is the mass velocity, and then you have the densities and uh, specific volumes of the, uh, of the different phases. And then you also have uh, X sub L is the quality at the outlet of the, of the flow channel. And so these, these correlations, I think it's fair to say people still use them uh, quite routinely, both the form, and, and he, he was using um, forms that were available in the literature, uh, but also the exponents, the details of the correlations. So you know, I asked myself, you know, what, what makes a paper great? And, and certainly you can have a great paper that, that has uh, the... A lot of deep content, uh, thoughtful presentation, uh, but uh, even beyond that, another piece of evidence, at least, that, that uh, the paper is great is that uh, many other people follow the work and build on it. And so what I've done here uh, is to uh, do a, a citation search uh, on the paper, the Bowers and Mudawar paper, and um, I have I've taken I've removed the review papers. There were quite a few review papers uh, that had a high citation count. I took 
the papers that cite the Bowers and Mudawar paper um, and ordered them uh, by how many citations those papers had. And this is the result. Again, I excluded uh, review papers. But um, you can see that the, uh, that the list is very impressive. I think the topics, if you look at the topics, there's a lot of things, even in single phase, uh, some single phase studies that were they looking at, at uh, friction factors in, uh, in microchannels. Uh, but even the, the list of names is very impressive. You have Bud Peterson, and Peng, and Ku. Um, there is Ken Lacar a couple of times, uh, Ku a couple of times, uh, Art Burgles. Uh, so th there's, his work has been you know, followed very closely by a number of people. Um, and these papers themselves, of course, are, are uh, in, in their own ways, you know, very, very significant uh, pieces of work that are still, in many cases, cited today. And you can see that the, the range of years, uh, just a couple of years after the Bowers and Mudawar paper, the, the Peterson paper came out. Um, and then some even more recent things that have had obviously a lot of a lot of interest uh, based on their citation counts. And so beyond the sort of citation metrics, um, there's you know the, the question: what happened in the community? What, what's really happening? Uh, and have we learned something? Are there new questions and points of focus? And indeed, I think in this case, uh, the, this paper led to a very uh, significant number of branches, actually, in, in topics of study. Uh, there's the, kind of the classic uh, uh, flow regime study for small-scale channels. So you have this, uh, you have a little bit of subcooled, boiling, saturated, and then you have um, annular flows and a, a wide range of different flow types inside of the channels that people are now doing wonderful things with visualizing and characterizing local heat fluxes and such. Um, the, the flow constraints uh, is another, that's another factor. Uh, pressure drop as a function of heat flux, this curve that we saw before, you know, it's still a very significant issue and I think part of what people would like to do is to, is to moderate that pressure drop and get the similar or same heat transfer performance and that really does argue based on the results of this paper for a uh, more intermediate range of, of channel sizes. The other thing that's become a big, um, a big topic is the mitigation of pressure drop instability and fluctuations and so that, uh, that has to do with when uh, vapor forms uh, in a sort of concentrated way um, a localized way in a channel, it can block the flow and, uh, and cause uh, a change in the pressure drop and sometimes backflow. Uh, and that's listed on the right here, some of these anomalies uh, where you have vapor that can actually shoot out the opposite direction under certain circumstances and that causes a premature critical heat flux and, and you know, some very practical issues. And being able to control that and Control usually, uh, as a prerequisite, requires understanding. Um, that's a big topic that remains very active today. So to conclude, I'd like to thank, first of all, Isam. Uh, he is he's a, uh, a model to emulate, uh, certainly one of the greatest experimentalists that I have ever known. Um, I'd also like to thank the organizers and you, the audience, uh, and I appreciate your time. My hope, even though I can't answer some answer questions live, um, is that uh, Laurent or others could start a short discussion if you have time. If you don't, then I will just uh, bid my adieu and uh, thank you very much again.